as a, as a first question, I kind of wanted to wanted to ask two points which have been uh, brought up in the chat um, quite a lot to Anna, Chris, Brian, and John. Um, the first one is, as John said, local authorities are under huge stress at the moment, huge pressure. Um, one of the questions was, is there anything that communities can do, uh, parentheses, without getting in trouble, um, to help? Which I think is a really nice point and something to, which would be nice to reflect on. And then again, um, there's lots of frustration in the chat that the, the C word car has been mentioned at all. And I think it's really interesting that I think it's obviously something we have to appreciate that it's very different in urban conditions to rural, suburban or and countryside conditions. What can we do to allow people who just genuinely have to use a car in the immediate term to get near enough to uh, an urban area and then transfer to a cycle system? Like what, what can we do to sort of to, to allow those sort of systems to merge in, in an effective way at the moment. And I'd invite the panel to sort of comment on those two points. Um, okay, I'll come in. Um, I think the, the one about what communities can do, um, rather than necessarily getting out and painting things yourselves, although I have often threatened to go and buy some white paper from B&Q, um, and obviously I've never done it, um, support us in what we're doing. Uh, I think all politicians need to hear why this is really important not necessarily from the cycle campaign groups that do a fantastic job already, but as I was saying in my remarks, um, my neighbour who has gone out and bought a bike because she wanted to cycle because she needed an hour away from her kids every day and now she's thinking I could actually get to work um, when I go back to the office on that bike. Um, all of you who have those, uh, those thoughts or have neighbours or have friends who are doing that, say to them, write to your councillors and just say, I'm not a cyclist. I wasn't a cyclist. I still don't think I am one. I've bought a bike and I'd really like to get somewhere safely. And tell us those stories in your own words because I think it can be really, really powerful um, for politicians to hear from people who, for whom this stuff will really, really matter um, and who perhaps they didn't hear from before. Uh, I think that can be really useful. So, um, and, and supporting the stuff, uh, again, uh, we've got a really great, strong cycle campaign here in Glasgow um, campaign group, and they um, have been great at cheerleading and, you know, saying this isn't perfect. The cones aren't, you know, our dream segregation, but they're there. They're there really quickly, and that's great. And the next step will, will make things even better. So um, I think positive cheerleading is really important and telling stories um, and not just always being the same people in our inbox, but different stories and different people, I think is really, really powerful as well. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Can I come in? Of course. Just because uh, you've been so positive, I'll, get, I'll give some negative as well. <laughs> of what, That's what I do in the world. Um, basically, I've been asking communities to kind of uh, gather evidence, take pictures, show where there's issues, send that to local councillors and then that, that really helps us do stuff in the we're also in a Greater Manchester using Commonplace and a, a mapping GM tool to have a forum. And I know Liverpool are doing the same as well, where people can actually log where there's issues in there. There's one, there's, the, there's a list of the things that I came up with, but it's also where do we do them? Where do we really need them now? Where's the pharmacy that's overloaded? Where's the shop where people can't queue? Um, this is all like vital information and we need the communities to give it at the moment. So it's quite difficult to go out and assess streets as engineers so uh really that's that's the best way i can think of involving outsourcing in it yes yeah absolutely brian as you as you've got as you've got the four uh, is it um any comments about how we can potentially um understand that some people in the rural areas might have to drive and how, what can we is there's some people saying um how do we rebrand rebrand park and ride to uh to, <laughs> to park and cycle um yeah, I mean, absolutely, people still have to drive. I uh, don't think anybody's going to deny that in there. It's just those uh, those short trips, if we can create a non-hostile environment now, then ho I'm hoping people will make the choice because uh, we're all here, the comments that people are quite liking, being able to breathe clean air and be able to get around their neighbourhood. So we want to keep that going. And then the way they do that is not to go back into the car. But well, people who are doing longer distances in there, yeah, it, it nearly made it onto my list, the whole park and uh park and ride thing or park and walk uh, certainly something that's been discussed in Greater Manchester so uh, yeah, cars aren't going away there's lots of them I think we've probably reached peak car but we still have to deal with them and people have to get there particularly our key work workers we want to let them know that the environment's changed and it's not going back to the way you were so there's some street design stuff we can do and speed limit stuff we can do but there's also like a, I think the, the opportunity to, to give people a better option that's what I'm looking at in the main there's still what is it 88 percent of our trips in greater manchester are under five miles that's the market 88 percent of the trips absolutely 
And I think, um, if I might say, Chris, I think the focus please. on that is the most important thing. The simple fact is there are lots of people who have gotten a situation and they tend not to live in cities, obviously, where they don't currently have anything like a choice. It's a car or bus. You know, there isn't a decent bus service where they, the distance that they need to cover are, by, are too long for bike and they're on roads that would be, um, they rightly consider would be unsafe. I think that, so for me, the challenge is for where can we make a difference? And I think that one of the, there was a couple of questions asked, and I think this is quite important. I think the ability to make a difference is, you know, notwithstanding what I said about um, asking for permission, uh, asking for forgiveness rather than permission. I think the ability to, to, to do what we want to do is dependent to some extent on public understanding or understanding of different stakeholders as well. I'll quickly come on to uh, different types of stakeholder in, in a moment. But the, the big the, the big thing is, you know, people will, you can easily see, I've got a car, the distances are fairly long, I don't want to go on a bus and so forth, I have no idea, it's too far to walk, uh, I, I wouldn't want to cycle and it's too dangerous to cycle because there are cars around. We need to be confident, and when I say we, it's not much point in those of us on this call being confident in this, but local authorities as well are just talking about the pure the sort of numbers game of space. You won't all fit, you can't all fit. And this is a game that certainly London are trying to play. They're being very explicit about the fact we just have to have thousands more people cycling and walking than they do at the moment because we just can't fit otherwise. Now, that's obviously at the city end, but I think it's important to be able to have a narrative for that, which is plausible and just really quite ordinary. It's not about some kind of you know mad eco thing or, or sustainable this or that or the other or any kind of um, you know elite catcher nonsense. We just can't all fit. This is how the numbers can work. And to be honest, for my take, I would, I think that's, I suspect, and I obviously don't know, that's highly likely where the government announcements from last weekend came from about this. They're just looking, finally, actually looking at some of those sheer numbers and thinking this cannot work if we do it. You know, with the, with the public transport capacity down, cars cannot literally fill the gap because the gap isn't too big. These other things will have to do that. Um, on a slightly different tack, I spoke about different cycles, taking other people with us, and then again maximising the, the the situation we're in at the moment. What you will normally find, um, Brian, Brian has token, to, spoken about this, and a couple of other people have about getting rid of car parking in town centres. As many of us will know, that's the kind of thing that will get most anger or just most opposition when you're suggesting that. Normally, I really think now, and I think we certainly have to try to channel the fact that actually what I think a lot of um, shop owners and other business owners in town centres will appreciate is that space is of the essence. Where are their people going to queue if they're going to be out there? Where are they going to sit if there's a cafe or something like that? You know, how are they going to walk past while people are queuing and or sitting at cafes? And actually, you think, well, you could perhaps, I was we were talking about a, a, a street in Ireland the other day, you could, you could inhabit the near side, you could take or take the parking lane, we'll put some tables and chairs in that. But then you're sat next to a bunch of really busy, actually a bunch of traffic with some busy trucks. And you think people can see, I think, when you come at it, coming back to your point earlier, Chris, about the economy, People can see this is what our high streets need now is the space for people to, to shop in comfort and safety, to enjoy being there, to stay that bit longer. And I do think there is that chance now to say this is another reason why we need that space. And perhaps to make it more plain than we've been able to in the past to say that the space in our streets and our town centres isn't just about movement. It's plainly not about movement. It's about queuing, for example. It's about that coffee you can't sit out and have now or that meal or whatever it might be. We have that chance to, to basically, I think, really explain how we can use this space differently and you will benefit from that. Fantastic, yeah. Um, I'm conscious of the time, it's really flying by, but I just wanted to bring um, Chris Borman in and, and ask him, um, we've heard in the, in the new national guidance that a, the creation of a national walk-in cycling champion and inspectorate is on the cards. And I just, as um, you're the one with experience, I was wondering what powers do you think it's essential for that role to have? Um, well, I think when I asked for, um, or rather when Andy Burnham phoned me up, um, the first thing I did is speak to Andrew Gilligan and say, what do you need? And he said, you've got to have some form of control of the cash because that's your leverage, that's your influence. And the other bit is you have to be answered directly to the mayor. You've got to, you've got to be talking to the boss because culture change, uh, it's hard enough already. So 
you need to, you need that because I have no interest in a, a figurehead position. I've got plenty of other things going on in my life, and I think it's the same thing really. Uh, that role requires uh, requires somebody with a mandate to fulfil. Um, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't even, I'm not even sure it's a good idea unless you're putting somebody there to do a job. Um, I loved everything that Grant Chaps has said in the last two weeks. It's been an uh, absolute breath of fresh air. I didn't like it when he said, a cycling champion, somebody to inspire us, because I don't know about you, but that's not a job I want, you know, because that's not what's needed. It, it needs somebody to go and get a job done. So yeah, I guess you have to have the experience of that, enough knowledge to do that. Um, and be good at communication, I think is the, the main one, because this is cons, okay. and I've been... Watching the string while I've been listening because I'm, I'm actually pick, picking up an awful lot. Um, and I'm also looking at some of the traps that we set ourselves because I've lived in this world and I, I'm sort of aligned with everybody who's here. And we talk about logic and the people who have to change are not interested in logic. They're interested in easy and they're interested in things that are fun and, and make me money and things that I'm interested in. Uh, and right now they're scared and they want easy and they're worried about money. And the people who make the decisions, what are they worried about? They're worried about huge amounts of cash loss. They're worried about being seen to do the right thing. And, and we need to keep that in mind when we decide what actions we need to take. Um, and so that's why I had, a, I had a little stab at trying to, we need to frame people who do this as normal people who are helping the NHS. So what have people been talking about? Clapping the NHS, right? Well, you want to be in that gang. And you want to reframe it so that people see somebody riding a bike and they go, that's a club I want to be in. I'm a transport hero. I'm freeing up road space for all those other people. And I want to be one of them. And it's something I can do because it's only three miles. I'll just give it a go. And that's what we, we need to do. So I've gone completely off topic and answered a different question that suited me. Um, but I, I think the language is really important. Um, I didn't want to pick up on that, but we need to think not what we want to tell people, what we want them to hear. We have to think what does the other people want to hear and how do they make decisions? Because every time we let go of that, the shutters go up and yeah, 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 blah, blah, pollution. But I've got to get the kids to school. I've got to be safe. So would you like your kids to be able to walk to school? Yeah. Okay, I'm listening. What about if I put these crossings in forward? Would that do it? Yeah. So would you support these crossings? Yeah. I've joined the dot so you don't have to run the kids to school. Um, and and it's, I think that's really important that we don't forget that. That's what's going to win hearts and minds, is make people feel good. As Anna said right at the start, make people feel good. Clap the people who do well. Make the people who aren't doing well feel really uncomfortable, but give them a way to win. And it has to speak to their needs, not our needs. Brilliant. And it's a really interesting point that both you and, and Anna have made the idea of breaking down these silos between different modes of, of different ways of getting around and stopping the tribalization of cycling, as you put it really very nicely. And it's it, how, how do we take that forward in your, in your opinion? Um, it's it's, it's a, the idea of people are clapping every Thursday for the NHS. And the, uh, how do we actually connect transport to, um, to, to, to that sort of ambition? Well, I mean, pretty much what I've just said in that you've got to make it somebody who has to change what they want. Um, I really want this message not to come from anybody here, including me. I want the transport secretary to be saying, I want health to be saying, we need this. It's an emergency. If you ride a bike, you're helping us. That's what we need. Um, and so that, in a sense, we need, we need to work by back channels. I mean, I feel like giving health a poke and saying, come on, this is you. This is your interest. This is how we save the NHS. So right now, you've got a voice in transport. You will never have a voice in transport again. Get out there and tell people. If people change the way they travel, all those people clapping you, this is helping you. Um, and I think from a political side, that's what I need to be doing right now. Get other people to say this and then be clapping them visibly for doing it uh, and make it nothing to do with cycling. It's to do with, with helping us in this crisis. And fundamentally, getting people to just try something different because when they do it, they like it. Yeah. Can I come in on the health Please. thing as well? Um, I think something that's been really interesting in the work that I've done in the low emission zone is how we frame transport policies actually as health policies. And with air quality, a lot of what we've always known is that um, it'll do you a lot of harm in 20 years' time. It'll shorten your life expectancy. 
Um, and what I think changed the narrative and, and really changed my thinking was hearing about the research into if you are in a polluted city, your risk of heart attacks in the next four or eight or ten hours will be different. For example, um, the fact that we know that air pollution is getting into placentas and having an impact on your baby who is growing right now. Uh, those types of um, immediate impacts, I think, are what perhaps shape behaviour more than this will be bad for you in 20 years' time. Uh, and I think that's been really interesting around this as well, because we know that cycling is uh, one of the most effective public health interventions we can make across the board. Um, but up till now, cycling has been good for public health in terms of, well, you won't be as uh, unwell uh, or less fit in 10 years' time or, or whatever it might be. Whereas with COVID, what we're seeing is that there's a very direct threat to people's health today and a threat to their family today or tomorrow. Um, and there's something very interesting about how we talk about this being a public health emergency um, right now with a direct threat. You can't see it, but cycling and walking um, and, and social distancing are part of the solution to that. Um, and I think that's why um, we've certainly in Glasgow been talking a lot about these measures going in quickly. Um, and we're doing them right now uh, under delegated powers, uh, as, uh, as John was saying with the, the gas leak analogy, because this virus is in the air right now. It could harm you today. And every day that we don't put interventions in uh, is another day that we aren't doing the most that we could do as a local authority to protect the NHS and to protect our people. Um, and I think there's something very interesting there around direct uh, immediate threats versus long term better health. Um, and maybe we should be thinking about that. I don't have all the answers, but we should be thinking about that uh, when we look at how we talk about these interventions. Absolutely. And it's, it's certainly something I've been thinking about in terms of how we how we get the future right and, and looking at, <laughs> let's, let's say, one of the next crises of, of climate emergency. And how is that sort of what can we in a way, what, what are we learning from our response here that we can apply to that thinking? And, and even, even to the extent of the sort of the climate, climate change, climate emergency narrative has, has often been about save the planet. But actually, it should be about you know, save yourself, save your own skin, because it's, it's not the planet which is going to die. You're going to go first. And that, that, that is quite an interesting reflection, actually, the, in messaging is incredibly powerful. And again, it comes back to the point of psychology that Chris raised, which is, which is spot on. Um, was John waving? Do you want to come in, John? Or are you? Um, I've probably said enough, haven't I? No, I wasn't waving. I've just moved my hand. But since okay. you've asked me in, Chris, I think, yeah, so I'm thinking two things. There are, there are two sides to this, and, and I would absolutely agree. Uh, it, it, interestingly, in one of the places we've been working for a long time, if you want to get stuff done, you need, just need to be appealing to, to ordinary people in the way that they're not interested in cycling or even necessarily walking or this, that or the other. They just want to get about and do their lives. And I suppose that's partly what I was trying to say in terms of what we might be talking about in high streets and that way of, of, of rethinking how the space is used. What do you want to do here? If you ask people, most people want to be able to walk about comfortably, safely, cross the road, come back, get a coffee, all that in clean you know, we've, people have spoken about that already, about what we're assuming that most people are enjoying about the quiet streets they have at the moment. It's that. What do you want your high street to be like? That's a, that's a narrative to be that. You know, you can't get to work. I suppose that's why I was talking about the numbers game earlier. We can't, we just can't all drive. So it's not about being a cyclist or anything like that. I think somebody's commented about the fact that it's not helpful to use necessarily to have um, a sporty types and stuff like that. It's just you on a bike, right? Um, and you can actually walk. Um, somebody's talking about Charles Dickens in the in the chat earlier, walking 20 miles. A uh, big fan of Charles Dickens, I should say. But I think 20 miles a day is a bit much for most people. But I saw a headline the other night about, uh, I think it was in, the, in, in London or something like that, walk a mile to work. And you think, my word, is that a thing? That's 15 minutes, you know, 20 minutes, maybe 25. 30 if you're really enjoying yourself right you know it, these, these the distances aren't huge and it's just trying to make that seem ordinary like uh, chris was saying earlier that's just that's just what you do it's the best choice you've got and, and enabling on, that choice to happen i've touched on that point exactly before is that, that idea of the theory of hedonistic urbanism which i'd like to roll out which is don't expect people to do good connect self-interest and societal good through the way you design these infrastructure and yeah. actually make the way to get around which is best for the best for everyone else and best for the planet the most fun and then, and then quickly on the other side, it's back to this, that's all very well, but actually how does practically does anybody do the stuff we need? And I've seen some comments about uh, the opportunity for um, people to get, you know, do, it, do, it, do, it, do it cheaply, do it quickly. We've been talking in Glasgow about using, you know, trying to make it, when we go to our next phase, especially, which is how can we make this look better than just, the, you know, the city is going to be a work site for six months or more. 
Um, and uh, somebody was talking about, you know, there's, there's, just, there's probably a surfeit of plants and planters that people that, that, that supplies haven't been able to get rid of recently. We may be able to use those. And that's possible. Although, interestingly, with that, again, well, how do we join up? A council who never normally talks to these kind of people. How do we even know that they exist? Where is that stock of plants? And um, what do we do? It. How do we? S what about the crash rating of the pots we might put them in and stuff like that? It can get quite complicated. But I think what we need to be doing critically for me in all of this, everybody is trying to do it right. Well, I say everybody. It's loads of authorities are trying to do it, and the ability for the councils and the selves, almost peer to peer to be able to share information, I think is incredibly, incredibly important. So that, you know, that Glasgow is not doing something that Edinburgh is then trying to do, and they probably will anyway, because, you know, um, but then all these other, which are, tell us, what have you found? What have you learned? What works? What, how did you do your orders? What kind of kit have you found? Um, you know, it, it, there's the opportunity to get together, perhaps to, to bulk buy and stuff like that. So sharing information at this time to expedite speed. And I keep coming back to that. We can have all great ideas about how's the best way to sell it and stuff like that. The sheer ability to do stuff is the thing that will hold us back for the most time. Just deploying the time, the staff resources and the kit is, is, is the real challenge. Just, just coming back to that point of delivery with, um, We've had a lot of talk in the chat, and, and Brian also mentioned the idea about workplace and how we can how we can work with off with businesses and and, and places of work to actually um, get more cycle parking around offices because obviously there's, there's very limited um, cycle parking in lots of in lots of office spaces around the city. Um, the streets can only take so much. I see TFL have, have um, are starting to starting to think about how we can sort of get temporary and, and emergency cycle parking outside places. Have, has anyone on the panel got any experiences of working really closely with business to get these? to get these things on the ground and, and, and any lessons they can say or, or any ideas about that fact. You want to come in? Uh, always. I can always talk about anything. So if, the, if there's silence, I'll, uh, I'll fill it. Um, yeah, I was, I was chatting. To, <laughs> yeah, indeed. I was chatting to a journalist from the Sunday times the other day. He wanted to do a story on, on this and employment and what they were doing in there. I was going, look, I, I don't know what heard Amazon have done a few things, but like, uh, for me, it's a duty of care to your employers. People are reorganizing their workplaces so people can stay at a social distance in there. But you've got to think about a travel plan for how your workers are getting there. And really, there should be a big call to say, like, like if you're in London, well, and you work in central London, okay, just people from zone two. Let's, let's talk about how you're going to be able to walk or cycle or get there in like a, a more sustainable way, really. That's not going to damage the environment and the other people out distance. And uh, for me, that's like a, that's good practice, but it doesn't seem to have uh, come into the health and safety. And I think uh, we have the techniques for doing uh, travel plans and for helping people, this sort of stuff. And, uh, and I'd, I'd love the government to make a bold statement on that to say that that's the people that we want coming in first, because we're all seeing the pictures of the, the people streaming off the buses and all the people that have to go in there on the, the small contracts and all the rest of it. We're, we have to do something to enable that. And for me, putting the duty on employers and uh, looking for the private sector to find solutions is a, is a way forward. And I'd like to see it happen. Guys, I'm going to have to dip off, I'm afraid. Um, if anybody's got a final burning one, I'm happy to answer. But uh, there's a table laid over there with lots of people sitting at it. Unmute, Chris. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, that was it. Yeah, um, I, I'm sure we can continue the conversation in, in different ways and let you get off. <laughs> Chris, I wonder if I might quickly come in. There's, uh, some, there's some chat about, we've spoken about local, uh, sorry, uh, low traffic neighbourhoods. We haven't actually spoken too much about it. There's been some chat about that, and especially about school streets. And again, this idea of actually contacting uh, people and sort of working through sort of different networks. I think working, so to speak, at the school gate, I think there's a real opportunity with that. Um, and there's a real need. There's a real need as well. Um, and uh, I know that Transport for London is at the moment is working on getting guidance out to boroughs about emergency school streets. Um, and... Uh, tying that in with the, the, the measures you might use there, trying, trying to tie that in with 
some emergency load traffic neighbourhoods. And I think that will help the picture as well, it's not least just because that's a very ordinary thing. If we start talking about neighbourhoods, people tend to live on in neighbourhoods for the most part. Loads of people are connected with schools, just ordinary people who aren't worried about this, that and the other. But that's another means of trying to just engage with people, you know, just just very directly about the fact that actually this is good to have less traffic in these streets uh, by outside your school more space so you can queue and chat still while you're distant from you know we're talking about a couple of weeks but we're also talking about six months away um the ability to not just have less traffic in the street in a big piece of tarmac which is closed up for a short period of time but actually within that having space semi-permanently and perhaps permanently taken um, in order that um, people can do that. And then applying that at the neighbourhood level as well. And I think the real, one of the great things that we have the opportunity to do, and this de involves deploying very little kit, is to, is to actually filter neighbourhoods. It does involve... Let the man you know, have his a, dinner, a John. Planters. Sorry? Where's the question? Let the man have his dinner. He's that gone. was to me. Oh, is he gone? <laughs> oh, uh, I thought that was the question to Chris. Oh, no, you... <laughs> oh. Shut it. Sorry. Anyway, I've said it now, but I think Sorry we haven't, we haven't Sorry, spoken man. much about local, lo low traffic neighbourhoods. We haven't. Um, and, and, and I think there's a huge thing because they are really cheap to do. They just take more planning. That's the key thing. Yeah, and I know, I know Anna mentioned that she was looking at quite a few in Glasgow and... Um, I don't know how far is that. Is that sort of an emerging plan, or is that a plan that you're sort of accelerating as part of this, of the of your response to this crisis, or is that is that something you're trying to accelerate? Uh, yeah, so I saw one of the um, the comments earlier uh, was asking why I talked about uh, modal filters as a medium term, and I have to say that I've completely changed my concept of what we talk about as short term and medium term. Um, so just to kind of clarify that first. Um, we don't really have a big problem with traffic at the moment because here in Scotland we're still very locked down. Um, we don't seem to have uh, done what England has done, which is to uh, to suggest that people can do all sorts of different things now, possibly or possibly not. Uh, I'm not quite sure what your public health messages are down there. Um, so at the moment we are still very much in the lockdown phase um, and the, the most important thing for us at the moment is to get that uh, physical distancing outside uh, shops and things and also to, to get these cycle lanes in where we, we can. Um, so that people who are already moving, um, essential workers especially, can move um, a little bit more easily. Um, but certainly the, the Liverpool neighbourhood strategy, that uh, was due to be, be ready uh, by hopefully the end of this year, and that was going to be the start of, um, of really looking at how we create low-traffic neighbourhoods across the whole city over the longer term. Um, but I do think that some of the learning we've already got from there, some of the learning from other cities, we are going to just have to pull some of that forward. Um, I think we're going to have to make sure that we don't let rat running come back, um, that we don't, um, as, as if, if we see increased traffic congestion, if we see more cars, the last thing we want is for those cars to start going into residential streets. Um, so I think um, it will be a necessity to do it sooner than we would have. Um, and as I said, uh, looking at school streets as well, um, it, it was really important to be working on that. We were already planning our expansion program uh, for the next tranche of schools for that. And we were looking at that in terms of the safety of the children from vehicles um, so that they could walk the, the last 100, 200 metres to the school um, and not be at risk from cars reversing and so on. But actually now we've got a whole other emergency here, which is I don't know what school pickup will look like, um, but certainly the, the last couple of days um, of school here in Scotland before uh, the lockdown, we were starting to figure out what social distancing meant. Um, and we could not stand on the pavement outside my kids' primary school. We had to all spread out across the road. Um, it will become impossible to do a school pickup socially distanced unless we bring school streets in very, very fast as part of this um, emergency response. And I think, again, that's very interesting. We have to shift the conversation. We're not doing this to stop your kid getting run over, although that's great. We are doing this because otherwise you cannot safely stand with your toddler eh, and wait for your primary school age child to come out. And again, it's just that urgency of narrative that I think is really, really interesting. Um, and I think eh, that is also going to start to apply to modal filters eh, probably far sooner than we would have um, in terms of the conversation happening in Glasgow around the new strategy. Absolutely. Well said. I think just one question which I've seen uh, come up is just in, in your opinion, is there anything left uh, to get in the way of local authorities' ability to get out there and, and do this work? Is there anything which we need to be campaigning for or calling for as part of this group? I think we're just about there. Um, I think it's 
something we need to acknowledge is, and I think John said it um, very well earlier, this is a lot of hard work. This is a huge job. Um, it looks really simple when you look at the photos. And again, I do it myself. I put a photo up of some cones and go, look, we did this in 10 days. Yes, we did because people worked long hours. People have put aside projects that we were working on. Um, we have mobilized into this emergency response. Um, this isn't just a simple thing to do on top of everything else we're doing. Um, right now, it's what we are doing instead of business as usual. And at a certain point, business as usual, we'll have to come back in um, with whatever other uh, complications we have, whether that's people working differently, whether that's people um, having reduced resources, whatever it might be. So um, I think, if anything, a bit of realism around how difficult this is um, and keeping the energy and momentum behind it and um, making this very mainstream. Um, we're hearing, you know, both uh, Scottish and, and the UK parliaments talking about this as if it's completely normal um, that we need to allocate space to walking and cycling. That's amazing. Um, and let's keep that to the point that it's just seen as, well, of course, that's a good thing. Nobody would be against it. Um, let's just keep that and make it absolutely embedded as this is what business as usual will look like in future. And I think I think your, your comments around schools are key as well, because sort of speaking about schools and school trips are always it's a great leveler, isn't it? It's, it's a very it's a great sort of opening into that conversation. Of we need, everyone everyone agrees that we need children need to be safe getting to school. And I know that Living Streets are working sort of across the country, up in Scotland and, and down in here in England. With, with schools to sort of promote school streets uh, even more than normal. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that the sort of the offer from help from Living Streets, I'm sure, is there. Um, just, I've got a couple of technical questions for Brian, if that's, uh, if, we, if we want to get really geeky. Um, am I correct that a contraflow cycle lane still needs the TRO and only with flow don't? Well, yeah, if, if, if the order's been passed and it's a one flow, yeah, it's a one-way road and you put it in the second direction in there, then, yeah, put the orders through. Yeah, so that, that is correct. Very good. That's, that's very specific. <laughs> I had loads of things to say on Lange's planning, but I'm just waiting to crowbar that in. Um, what's the other technical one? Um, another one was, um, we've spoken a lot about um, sort of immediate infrastructure um, on links and creating space for cycle lanes. How, how, what's your advice for junctions and how we deal with those in, a, in an immediate way? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. That, and it's one that I'm trying to get my head around at the moment. Like uh, there's certainly stuff we can do about the geometry of junctions, particularly for cyclists and then create more like physical distance as well. So I was, I was talking to John about this the other day about a big roundabout and go, well, what do we do there? I go, well, we put cones out and we give it a continental geometry. So it's a single approach lane in there and that you're turning in and you're turning out re-entrant curves and all that sort of stuff to, to mimic what they do. And then you've got a much more like a hospitable place also, like uh, things like putting extra signal crossings on approaches. A lot of our signal junctions have uh, just got a crossing on on one arm, for example. If you put them on multiple arms, and you really get a completely different uh, look and feel to it from the pedestrian side. And you've got other places to cross, so you can like uh, do the social distance. Uh, I've been experimenting with um, stuff we could do with signal junctions as well. Perhaps having like a uh, storage spaces for cyclists, so they can perhaps uh, move across parallel with pedestrians and there. Uh, um, and like uh, one of the things we've done in Greater Manchester as well is to like adjust the signal timings of it so people have a, actually have time to cross again there and again to have it coming more frequently so we can double cycle junctions in there so you're not waiting a minute and a half to get across there. It's coming up every uh, 30, 35 seconds in there. Again, all standard practice that we have in the rest of the world, um, but we can we can try it there. Probably the um, the big one, the big one we could do if, um, if the government was bold, and, and we're in a discussion area now, so I'm just uh, I'm like uh, coming up with some uh, wacky ones with you, but, um, and John will remember this when we did the International Best Practice Study, I uh, was at Transport for London at the time, um, allowing cyclists to go through reds, that's right, I, I said it, and if you go into Paris, and I'm always citing Paris because I love Paris, there's 1,800 junctions where cyclists can go through on red, and they put a little sign there, and it means that there's no other motor traffic moving, you can either do a a right or left, or in some cases, uh, go off to the left or right and do all kind of movements in there. So uh, as all cyclists know, if you've got an all ped stage, you'll never have a safer time to get across the junction. So removing the sanctity of the uh, green man crossing for pedestrians would be uh, one thing to look at. Um, I'm putting it all on the table these days. And, We're uh, in like, a crisis. You've got to think about these things. We're having a discussion. Let's get some drama in there. But um, 
that would mean pretty much uh, the vast majority of our signal junctions could then be safer for people cycling in there with a, a flick of a switch, uh, a sign going up and perhaps some extended uh, timing in there. But in some cases, it's just a sign like the French do. They do it, they swear by it, they've got set great safety results in there. So lots of practical ones and ways of getting there, but there are there is a nuclear option if we uh, if we really want to push it. Perhaps in Scotland, then that's one for you. If I can just quickly pick up on that, just going back to your original question as well, Chris, I think there's a couple of things coming up. One of the things we think, again, if just right now, how can we do stuff as quickly as possible? And I think one of the, the ways of increasing safety for cyclists at junctions um, is to get the cycle lane or the bus lane if they're in that to go all the way to the stop line they nearly always cut short or you just have that last little feed into some kind of asl if you can get to the stop line safely and i think there are real opportunities to do that then then that at least gets you there and i think you know as many people will know in most roads you just you to fight to even get to the stop line and when you're there you're exposed so i think the opportunity to get to it which you can on the link so use those kind of treatments so we are taking space for cycling as i said earlier you're making advisory cycle lanes mandatories and you're protecting those mandatories as well so that people can get to the line there's the other side of it as well which comes back we've spoken about space as space but we can also we need um we, we can deal with uh, capacity in terms of time as well and one of the keys is and that's obviously critical at junctions as you'll know if you've got two lanes and one's a bus lane then they flare to two at the, the stop line because so we can get the traffic through in order to get the cyclists and more buses and so safely through, you get then up to the stop line. That then just takes that much capacity away from general traffic as well, which helps redress the equation again. And it helps mean you just can't fit all these cars through. And actually, we can fit fewer through because we need to do this to expedite and make safe the, the, the buses and the cycling and also the walking, as Brian said, with other signals and stuff like that. That will take time out of the system, not just space in terms of general traffic. And it's against a simple numbers game. This is how we get most people through. And that's why we have to do it this way. Um, so I think it, it, in addition to the safety aspect at junctions, especially signalised junctions, there's a real capacity issue there, which has to play in favour of non-car modes. Great. Oh, just another question has been looking at. Is there, is there any data we should be collecting at the moment? Obviously, we've got... <laughs> It's, a, it's an unheard of situation and all bets are off in terms of previous data and future data, but is there anything we should be collecting at the moment to, to, to sort of inform our future decisions in terms of how we can keep whatever we put in place in the immediate term, longer distance, and to sort of demonstrate that, you know, and it didn't break, it didn't go wrong? Brian, you want to go first? Yeah, again, I, I told you I'd always come in. I had a really interesting conversation with, um, with Strava today, looking at all the data around the country there get to meet these people in there and uh, yeah chris was quoting like the 22 percent up to 75 percent. we were looking at the strava data in great manchester and other places and it was like a a 400 percent increase <laughs> it was like a, it was spectacular in there so um and um just uh not particularly plugging them over anybody else but the uh the thinking of making uh, a lot of that data free to local authorities and i think they're making some announcement <gasps> maybe i wasn't supposed to say that yet <laughs> Just realised, but it might <laughs> might be worth having the chats um, going in there because uh, yeah, it blew my mind seeing it all, and uh, I'm waiting to see all the all the full COVID like uh, data come in there. Uh, that's one thing that's uh, a new data set, but it is, it is difficult getting out and measuring things at the moment in a more physical way. Uh, just just to get into another like, we can be smart about th these things and speak to your Googles and, and the like, and. Uh, Again, I uh, speak to a lot of people. I was chatting to a guy from uh, Google about machine learning and artificial intelligence, and he, he'd run an API and he could hook into the TFL cameras and uh, run an algorithm, and it'd tell you what type of bikes and, and what the age and demographics of the people were from looking at it. It was quite, quite an amazing uh, system which gone in. So we, we do have technical ways if we can... Uh, we can move ourselves quickly to get data. Even if we can't go and set up new cameras on site, there are uh, techniques available to, to mention a couple. So uh, for me, you know, it'll be the great studied event for the next few years, and I'm mm. hoping it's the test case for how we respond to the climate emergency. So uh, we definitely need to get the data. I, th I think the only thing I would add to that is it's very difficult to compare with what we've got now. What we can do and should do now is know what the numbers are now. 
So under that circumstance, especially once we start to start to take spaces, just to be clear about, it's still this many or this this many vehicles are getting through, but critically, how many people got through? And I think one of the things this time will teach us, I hope, especially if with more people walking, cycling, and that we will value much more those numbers which we tend not to. Um, it's obviously very difficult to work out how many people are on a bus, and we will know for a while yet there'll be far fewer than there could be. Um, but I think the ability to actually to, to to actually just know how many people are moving along the street, especially walking and cycling, in a way that we tend not to. And, and as Brian has just alluded, there are new technologies that a lot of people have, which can be done use cameras as well. Um, I suspect it's worth doing that in a little while at the moment. We're kind of nowhere. It's just there's less traffic around and that's it. Or few more, fewer people doing different things. What we would like to see is how does that play when we have done something you know, of, of a substantial nature, I think. And there's frankly very little of that around at the moment um, to, that we can say, well, actually, it's worth knowing how many people fit through that space now that we've completely, re that street, now we've completely reconfigured the space because nobody has completely refigured the, reconfigured this the space on any street hardly other than a few actual closures in relatively uh, neighborhood areas like uh, down in lambeth and in edinburgh thanks very much <laughs> one, one thing we haven't touched upon um which i i know i know paris do and i think more and more people are starting to talk about it now is the idea of e-scooters and, and sort of micro mobility i was wondering if we have any sort of collective thoughts about where that fits in this story about um uh, reducing car like sort of vehicle numbers in city centres and actually giving people different choices. Brian, I know you had something to say. So what was that? I was responding to somebody's question on the on the thing. How we how we how we fit uh, e-scooters and micro mobility into this conversation? As oh, a, as fantastic! A, as yeah, a, get, um, an alternative to vehicles. Yeah, no, I've, uh, I've been doing a lot of thinking about e-scooters after after the announcement and then trying to make a case. In fact, I spent most of the day um, writing a case for e-scooters. It is, it is controversial in there, but um, if it's an alternative between people jumping in a car and people getting an e-scooter and getting into work that way, then I think it's, it's a choice that we absolutely have to make in there. And the, the government's gone big on it. And uh, they're talking about whether it's just the future mobility zones, of which there's only... Uh, a few um whether it could be extended and when we can look at bringing forward the legislation for me uh they, they fill a hole in, in when we're talking about cycling in particular there's always the kind of no way no how kind of marketing group of uh, drivers in there but an e-scooter well that's a new one and it's and they're really good fun you can take them anywhere and and to an extent and this is controversial because we don't necessarily want them on the footway but the infrastructure is there in a lot of places for them to use footway and hopefully some of these physical distancing strips that we're going to put in there. But it is there in a way that it's not quite there for, for cycling at the moment. So uh, I think we could, we could uh, potentially like a, have a, a huge influx of them and it would be quite a, a reasonable response to the, um, to the crisis. Whether we I feel like it's definitely part of the we have to think about. So, well, uh, yeah, I feel like... I, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. It's part of the solution. Um, um, lots of people don't. It's certainly controversial, but um, I mean, the collision record's pretty good. In terms of road danger reduction, these things aren't particularly dangerous, certainly not as dangerous as someone jumping into a car and then getting out on the streets, and then we have to adjust everybody and get people back on the footways and the top takers. All, all big problems there, but if people are starting to use e-scooters and we can promote that, then, then those majority of trips that are shorter than five miles become... Uh, quite easy um, if you've got an e-scooter. Um, I know London might think differently, but for rural areas, for kind of uh, cities like Manchester, we've got asphalt footways anyway that look pretty good <laughs> to ride a scooter yeah. on, I have to say. And then you can instantly turn into a pedestrian and when you do get to uh, pedestrian crossings and stuff. So um, for me, um, I think they are a solution in the crisis we're in and I'm trying to make that case. Um, but there's, there's definitely strong arguments against as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, just I'd invite any more questions from from, from the from the floor into in the chat if anyone has anything. Um, uh, there's a lot of chat going along, but I'm not sure about questions. Um, another thing I could have picked up in the, in the latest announcements, which is which I thought was really interesting, um, was the idea of um, a zero emission city, um, and apparently there will be just one um, zero emission city with its centre restricted to bikes and electric vehicles only, electric vehicles only. Um, 
Anna, it'd be interesting to get your take on 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 that idea. And if you if you think of any prime candidates in Scotland, um, I'm not not sure Glasgow, <laughs> sure Glasgow wants to throw its hat in the mix, but um, uh, um what, what, yeah, that's this is a conversation we've already had in Scotland, um, and certainly the uh, cabinet secretary for environment up here um, raised it as something in uh, that came out the last program for government um, for us to look into that. Um, I think the target date off the top of my head was possibly 2030, um, possibly earlier than that. I'd, I'd have to look it up again. Um, but certainly it was that conversation around low emissions is all very well, but um, we need to be moving past that. Um, and certainly you know, we've committed to carbon neutrality by 2030 um, as a city. Um, and I, I don't see how that will be compatible with having um, vehicle emissions because we know we can't get to zero emissions as a city, um, but the vehicle emissions are ones that we have to get rid of because there will be other ones that we just can't get rid of in that time scale. Um, so certainly um, Glasgow city centre um, is already going to be the low, is the low emission zone. Um, yeah. In 2022, the plan is it will be, um, it will include all vehicles. Um, so that's a fairly obvious um, box. It, it's a, you know, it's a grid pattern. It's fairly straightforward for people to understand. Um, I don't think we'd be asking too much um, to make the shift then from low emission to zero emission in due course. Um, but as I say, we have to get there somehow by 2030 yeah. anyway. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, just skimming the chat for any more questions. Has anyone got any questions from the floor? Does anyone, anyone ask as we're in our informal last half hour? Um, one, one thing I was wondering about is um, road safety audits so we've, and, and where we, lots of people are coming up with sort of immediate solutions um, to, to our streets and what people are thoughts and what do we think we need to be doing about road safety audits in the immediate term. Um, so do, do all changes require road safety audit or are, are we free to act without road safety audits in certain circumstances? Nothing requires a road safety audit other than on the trunk road or motorway network. So we don't have to have one uh, in any case. It would still be wise to do that. And, and my take on, on this, a couple of conversations I've been having, is that partly to do with just a sheer amount of kit, but also the look of it. If we're taking space that isn't otherwise protected, so for example, if you are going to take a, an indented parking bay for um, pedestrian space or queuing space, that's already protected by the nibs that it's indented behind. But if you're going to take space that is carriageway space and open at the moment, and therefore you're going to have to push traffic out, so to speak, and then there's a need, I think, to be really clear about your Chapter 8 kit, which is a traffic signs manual. You've got to do it right so that you've got the right signs and it's visible enough so that vehicles know to move out. Once you've got the end states fixed in that kind of way, however, you could probably be a lot more relaxed I think about what you do to hold the space along the edge where it's not going to be impacted in the same way um, both the, the 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 frequency of kit as it were that you use to protect the space bearing in mind that in a lot of these streets you want people you want stuff to be permeable anyway so that people can cross if they wish um, so I think there's there's you need to and I, my, my personal take at the moment I'm not aware of any road safety orders having been done but I think you'd want experienced engineers at least to be involved in that so that they can start to be aware of, use their professional judgment as to whether or not this or that is likely to be an issue. And that applies to things like even the, you know, the kit, even if it's not likely to get hit, but if you're, um, there was a comment about, you know, could you use non-standard kit? Can communities get involved and put plans out and this, that and the other? And you think, well, yes, but you need to make sure, for example, if you're using big plant pot, that if it just gets touched, it doesn't break into a thousand shards. Yeah. Or if you use some, you know, a, a wooden kit, it's not just going to smash and crumple and potentially be a hazard. Um, so just some basic thoughts about the robustness of kit. Um, but at the moment, I'd say that, again, with the, the need for speed, and dare I say it, Kate is on the call. So I'm sorry, Kate, just... just you know, the, the the cost of a road safety audit perhaps isn't necessary for a bunch of the stuff so long as professional engineers are doing them. But actually, Kate, let's say, tell, tell us about that. What do you think? Yeah, so, um, so I'm, a, I'm a road safety auditor, fellow of the Society of Road Safety Auditors. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, kind of horses for courses. So if you're doing something light touch, the safety assessment can be light touch. I'd rather uh, everything was assessed to a level and that might be a kind of proof of concept. So the first time you do a certain type of measure, you run it past somebody to think about 
some of the conflict stuff. So some of the things we're seeing is running uh, a wider footway, sticking some cones out into the carriageway so people can bypass the footway where there are people queuing at the road. Not thinking about the fact somebody with a wheelchair can't get down those curbs or they can't even see the curbs because the curb and the footway and the road are all made of the same colour material and they can't see them. So it's those kind of things, looking at conflict points, looking at where cyclists and pedestrians and motor traffic all come together. Um, I think doing a kind of principle assessment like TfL have done, you know, a kind of proportionate, you don't need to, you don't need to gold plate everything. I'd much rather a light touch toolkit to work out what works. We've been doing this, we've been doing um, safety audits of, with a small s, small a, of um, electric car parking. And we've identified loads of hazards that nobody had thought about. And then that's used to improve the designs, thinking about trip hazards, about, you know, even down to stuff like, is the charging cable a tonal contrast from the footway? So it can't be seen. Is it in a natural crossing point where people cross the road? People saying, oh, we didn't think about that. So I think use the safety audit skill, but not to do a safety audit, capital S, capital A. I think a light touch safety assessment is much better value. What Kate says always is always the thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> Checks in the mail. I think um, Anna, Anna has to nip off now, so I'm just going to thank Anna very much. Uh, it's been invaluable. Thank you for your contributions. Hello, Mini Anna. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Have a good evening. Thank you, you too. I'm going to have to go soon as well just to pretend that I've got something better to do. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think um, I think we're pretty ready to, to draw this to a close.